and she is here to present on privacy and confidentiality in the library, protecting users' rights. We'll take questions in the chat area, and we'll also have some live. We have both Adobe Connect and a live session going right now. So I'd like to introduce you to Ann Snowman. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to Privacy and Confidentiality in the Library, Protecting Users' Rights. I'm not sure whether it is communicated with you, but there was some pre-reading that you could do for this session. It's not necessary to have read it in order to um, in order to participate. Uh, and if you want to go back and follow up afterwards, there are your uh, resources that you want to look at. I'm going to let a couple people come in and sit down. We had a last-minute surge in attendance we weren't, that we weren't expecting. Okay, so what is privacy and confidentiality all about in the library? First, it's a strongly held professional ethic, articulated by the Code of Ethics and supported by the Library Bill of Rights, both drafted by the American Library Association, our professional organization. In 2015, uh, during a strategic planning session of the American Library Association, privacy and confidentiality was again listed as a core value of modern librarianship. Confidentiality helps ensure intellectual freedom, the right to freely inquire and inform yourself without the chilling effects of prying eyes and eavesdroppers. The right to pursue an inquiry is a corollary to, the, to free expression protected by the First Amendment. So go, stepping back a bit, the right to pursue an inquiry is a corollary to free expression protected by the First Amendment. In academia, the freedom to inquire and inform yourself provides scholars the latitude to challenge convention, create new ways of knowing, pursue new lines of investigation, and new scholarship. At Penn State Libraries, there is institutional policy that embraces the law and adds dimension not covered by law. Librarians have been so successful in advocating this point of view that we are now legally obliged to enforce privacy laws. This resource, Minowin Lipinski's The Library's Legal Answer Book, provides a nice compilation of all of the laws. Uh, across the states. Every state in the Union in Washington, D.C. has a law in the books protecting us against snoops in the library. Uh, this resource compiles all of them in a nice table format for quick reference. The Pennsylvania statutes have been updated since the book was published and have uh, a revised, we now have a revised reference for that. Um, it's always a good idea to have a copy of your state law handy if you're somebody who comes up against the privacy issues with some frequency. You can find our laws, the Pennsylvania laws, at www.legisstatepaus. Uh, you'll find the library theft laws there as well. Our state law is very broad and very narrow at the same time. It's very broad in the respect that there are no exceptions carved out for minors. There are no exceptions carved out for administrators, for um, you know, your attorney, for whomever. It applies across the board equally. Uh, 
and in other respects, it is narrow. It covers only circulation and only personally identifiable information. So the Pennsylvania law applies only to circulation records and personally identifiable, identifiable information. It's policies and other laws that broaden that for us. Uh, state law does not entail the use of the library or other resources. University libraries policies inform us about those the use of facilities and resources. What is FERPA? In addition to state laws, federal laws sometimes come into play. Uh, those of us in higher education frequently apply FERPA regulations when records are being accessed. This is the law that prohibits us from discussing financial matters with student families. Uh, simply stated, no third party, parent, professor, law enforcement officer, or anyone else has access to library records. Only the account holder and the library staff have access. Students sometimes sign a waiver to allow certain individuals access to their academic records. These waivers are time sensitive. They're they're limited by a time period and uh, very limited in scope. The waiver must be produced to be put into effect. You can't just say, oh, I signed the waiver. You have to produce it in order to get an exception. Uh, and uh, you can find more about FERPA on the registrar's website. So if we have these laws, why do we need a policy? We do have policy. A good policy describes the standards for day-to-day -day operation. It tells you what is expected. It is instructional. It also provides the administrative authority to take action. Staff are more apt to take action when they know that they're backed by the policy. We've seen that. University libraries policy can be found on the website. It's much more inclusive than the state law. Our policy, university libraries policies, those that were listed on that initial slide, are based on the Library Bill of Rights, the Code of Ethics, Pennsylvania Consolidated Statutes, university policies, and federal law. When we drafted the library's policy, we, we drew on the advice and research of others. We benchmarked with other academic institutions. We drew upon codified professional statements. If you really want to delve into the issue, <laughs> I recommend ALA's um, website, the Intellectual Freedom website. In addition to uh, the policies that I've discussed up until now and the laws, um, our policy is also informed by University Policy 8020. Uh, it tells us about workplace behavior. That policy will not be covered in this session, but it does inform our guidelines and policies. And that's the computer use policy that everybody's read several times. So now let's try out some instances. Um, my methodology for teaching this information is to use the scenario, the brief case study. Um, the ones that I'm going to present this afternoon are drawn from actual experience, experiences that I've had or others here in this library have had. Um, we started off this exercise with about 10, and it's grown to 23 now, of actual instances where we've had to apply law, policy, ethics, something like that. Scenarios are good training tools because they come, become a stand-in for uh, real experience. They exercise your critical thinking skills, help you apply uh, what you learn when a new situation arises that's similar but not exactly like another instance. So, are you ready? You want to try one out? Okay. 
Okay, this is the audience participation part. This one may be familiar. Um, a faculty member asks if a student in her class has a book checked out. She'd like to put it on reserve, but she's heard from other class members that this student has the book. She'd like to confront the student about withholding the book and preventing others in the class from reading the required material. What should we do? Do we have a, a is this a legal issue? Yes. Okay. What? Say no, she can't ask. You can't tell her that, but she can always put it on reserve and it will get recalled for the student. Okay. So we have recourse. We, you know, you know we can't, we're not going to tell you who has it checked out. And we're not going to be that bald about the way we say it, but we can't reveal that. We can recall it. We can purchase another copy. I mean, we have recourse. Um, uh, she wants to confront the student about withholding the book. Mm -hmm. Not withholding it. another way to do it. Okay, so a good start. We recognize the law, we recognize the ethics there. <laughs> okay, a similar situation. A patron demands to know to whom a particular book is checked out insists, grows animated and raises her voice, threatens to lodge a complaint with administration if she's not given this information. Well, what do you think? How are we going to respond here? <laughs> <laughs> That's one course of action. Are all, all good. Um, we requested that you repeat the answers on the tape as we're trying to listen to the tape for the video. Uh, <laughs> or could you speak louder? Because we only have the webcam microphone. Okay, I, I'll try to summarize. Um, we have several recourses. Um, we can provide the book in another way, but this particular patron wants to know who has it checked out. She's adamant about that. Who else is reading this book? Sometimes uh, other researchers want to know who's, con you know, who's conducting similar uh, research. And while on the face of it, that seems like a, you know, a nice thing to do to, to connect two people who are um, perhaps interested in the same subject. But we have to be careful. We, you know, you can get into a situation where more senior faculty person can coerce a less senior person. Um, you can upset the course of their scholarship by revealing too much about uh, what they're doing. You have a certain expectation that your research is your own. You don't really need to share it until you're ready to publish. Anything else on that one? Um, we, if someone's very persistent, um, we allow them to write a note to put in a book so that, like, if it's recalled from another person and they want to know who's getting it checked, like in a recall situation, someone has to give up 
their book and they want to know who the person is that requested it and are persistent and of course we can't tell them but if they write a note saying I'm interested in the subject who would you contact me that way it's the person who is getting the book that's their option of whether they want to network with the person who is returning the book and, and wants to know the other person. Okay. How do you feel about that? To act, the library acting as the intermediary there by re not revealing to either, well, no, you're revealing to the next user who the last user was. If do, you think, do you think it's possible that that could have a chilling effect on somebody if it seems that? The library was paying attention to what you were reading. I would just keep that to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 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 That's the nature of the book. What's the book about? It, you know, yeah. I'd be like, well, oh, take that too. If I'm reading something that I don't want other people to know, or to it's like, well, it's the Betsy Ardman murder. You know, why are they interested in that? Are they going to be stalking me now, or something like that? Well, they don't have to respond. That's the option. I mean, I under, uh, agree. Um, but I also don't want to withhold the ability for two people to coordinate information or scholarship. So it's. I, I would be reluctant myself to, to make that. I wouldn't call it that. Okay. Well, let's move on to a third one. A man approaches the service desk and identifies himself as a police officer. He has several library books that were found at a crime scene, and he requests information about who has them checked out. How should the staff member proceed? Ask for the search warrant. A crime has been committed. We, we want to be helpful if we can be. Anything from? Okay, so, so how are you going to respond to the police officer? Because I can tell you from experience, they don't know it's against the law for us to give that out. We're the ones who know that. Okay, so we're pretty much in agreement that we'll contact library's administration, they'll consult with university council, and they'll proceed from there. They may give the, um, the police officer enough information so that he can secure his warrant to get uh, the information that he wants. Okay, here come the police again. A uniformed Penn State police officer approaches the service desk with a photograph. He asks the staff member if he has seen this individual in the library. He then proceeds to ask the staff member for more information about what the individual has been doing or if he has been seen asking for any assistance. How should we respond? Is this a legal matter? A policy matter? That's where you draw the line? Yeah. I 
back there and throw it in the middle of the country. Well, at least, you know, you know, we're not going around looking at the right. trees or what they're doing, you know. <laughs> That's right. an invasion of privacy, so that would eliminate me. <laughs> okay, so an answer in the room is that to draw the line between, yes, I've seen him, but because we don't observe and no, take note of what people are researching, doing in the library, we're not going to tell them more. Well, I think it would matter, too. I mean, one of the questions I'd ask the police officer is, is, there, is, is this person a risk of some sort? Because if he really wants to know, you know, is this person lighting fires in the staff or have you seen them with certain, you know, paraphernalia, is this person a threat? And that's what the police officer is responding to? Then I would give more information than if he just wants to know. Okay. So you so want to know more about why the officer wants to know? When he asks what he's been doing, does he mean he should come every week and look at this particular material, or is he asking me, have you seen this person with this suspicious behavior in the last five minutes? Then there's a, a threat. Am I looking to respond to it? Okay. So th this scenario is actually getting us into some pretty gray area. And we, we did have a situation several years ago where the police were looking for someone, a uh, criminal, and came in over the weekend when the junior varsity is running the place and plastered photos everywhere to be on the lookout for this person. And library administration walked in on Monday morning and went, what? <laughs> what is this about? And that's when we developed the, um, the incident report form that everybody fills out. So get the, get the information up the chain of command. But yes, you have a little bit of latitude here. You have to use some good judgment. If the officer is doing a welfare check, you know, family's lost track of somebody, um, just want to try and track him down. You can say, oh yeah, he's here pretty reliably every afternoon. Um, he, he's been reading instruction manuals on how to do this or how to do that. Probably not. Probably won't share that. Okay, any other comments on that one? So a student's mom calls the library saying that there's a library fee on her son's current term bill. She wants to know what the charges are for and, and if she needs to pay them. She insists that she has the right to know because she's paying for her son's education. What, if any, information can we give her? If she's paying for everything, then yes, she needs to pay for it. Okay. Do you give up with the information? No. Well, you just say, yes, she needs to, it's a bill and she needs to pay it. Well, you can also tell that if the son wants to go through the process, you can give permission for people to, for people to talk, but otherwise it's the son. But there's a way for her to get help for her son instead of her. Okay. You could advise her that there's a waiver that she can have, that actually the son has to initiate to give her access. Any comments from us? Um, it's a privacy issue, like handing out the student's grades. And I'm trying to, if this is just louder because they can't hear us, I'm trying to do two, like trying to oh, it. Oh, you're so transcribing? They can, yeah, they can hear you, but they can't. Ah, I, I don't know how to help that. <laughs> okay, so this is FERPA. This is where we uh, put FERPA to use in the library. And th this is my most frequent um, experience with this, is that somebody's asking. At one time, we would sometimes uh, describe um, the reasons there could be a fee. 
Um, I have backed away from doing that. Um, really, you need to have that conversation with the account holder. That's um, just like the bank. When, yeah. when uh, the South say the South initiates the waiver, which I've yet to see a lot of confusion, who has that? Is that the broker's office who yeah. has that waiver? Okay. And do they then find out from us what the fee is for, or how does that work? I don't know. I've never seen it put in put to use. It's not easy to get this step done. I, yeah, I think that I believe the bursar has that, and it's time limited. It, it expires in a pretty short mm -hmm. period like of time. A semester, or a I think I think the person who requests the waiver says how long you have, and it's usually to reveal grades or something. So I would say that typically, when we tell mom or dad that Susie or Joey needs to get in here and take get that information, that's usually what happens. You know, I think it's a responsibility thing and the, the parents um, are accepting of that. Um, I've had very few that have said, I mean, they do say, well, I'm the one who pays the bill. And it's like, well, they checked out the materials. They can, they're responsible for them. They need to, you know, resolve them. And, you know, depending on the circumstances, there's a, you know, if the fine can be reduced, you know, I encourage that because, you know, it's like, well, these are for, you know, lost stuff and there's, you know, the fines can be taken down. So, um, I mean, you know, try to encourage mom and dad to instill responsibility in their kids to a degree. To a degree. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, moving on. A borrower asked to be excused from paying her library fee. She indicates that she was hospitalized and could not return the book on time. The library staff asked her to prove that she was hospitalized by submitting a doctor's note. What's the privacy issue here? Mm -hmm. So it, it, it could be, uh, it could be fake, but not really the issue here. It's that we have no, just as Tim said, we have no right to the patron's uh, private medical history. Now, if they happen to offer it without asking, you can take that into consideration. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, going back to the parent and the student, mm -hmm. what if the front line, um, what if they have the paper in front of them, like the fine paper in front of them, and they bring it to the desk? Are you allowed to? What if somebody had my bank statement <laughs> in front of them? It, yeah, uh, you're assuming a proxy relationship okay. there, but really the law does not carve out that exception. Okay. Uh, you really have to deal directly with the account holder. So if they put the paper in front of you at the desk and say, can you tell me what this fee is? You make sure that the person who's saying you might be the person who's named on that form. Very um, likely. What if they just want to know how the fine is broken down? Still, it's somebody else's account. Okay. How can we expect to waive a fee if they refuse to provide proof? Oh, for this one? For oh. um, I believe so. For the medical exception? That requires seasoned judgment. There's karma. 
<laughs> you know, it's, it's going to bite you anyway. So if you're going to sit there and I would just mm -hmm. read her song, write it on, yeah. and then put it on the reference, and yeah. you really can see. Yeah. And now they, they try to use that excuse too often. It's not as bite you. I mean, if they were about to die six times, then you yeah. know there's a problem. Mm -hmm. Tim, were you going to say something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can use the note record if, if you think you're being taken advantage of. Forged, that was the word I couldn't come up with before. Um, this comes up occasionally. Um, I don't think we really need to be in the business of making people prove, you know, that, they, that their claims are legitimate. You use seizing judgment. You can let somebody get away with a fine one time, uh, even if you know that they're taking advantage of you. But you can put that note in the note record that you, you know, you excuse the fine due to some circumstance, and the next time. Number? No? Okay. Okay. So. A borrower reports that her former friend used her library card without permission. She's trying to return everything checked out on her card. Should we tell her what the friend checked out on her card? Yes. Well, her account. Yeah, I know. I mean, her account. She needs to know what it's her account. Why can't she just go? If it's her account, why can't she go into my library account and see what the heck she was checking out? Yeah. Well, she can. That's a re resource to her. Does, yeah, just give her a copy of what was checked out on her account. Okay, you can that's have that. current on her account, it's not current. necessarily the. Does her friend have any expectation of privacy, or the former friend? We don't know if anyone she ever did. It's the patron's record. It's the patron's record. Yeah. The patron has mm -hmm. access to their own record. Um, the friend, in fact, has committed an act of theft and is entitled to no protection here. Um, and for this reason, that you are entitled to see everything in your library records, that's the reason that we don't put nasty notes in you know, the records. Seen that sometimes, you know, this is a, you know, a nasty patron and they're. Uh, well, they have the right to see that record, so don't put something in there that's going to embarrass the library. Okay, so the former friend comes in and said, I did this awful thing to my friend. What did I check out? I want to make sure I get him back. <laughs> okay, so in the room, they said she has. We provide no information to this person. Are we Not under any obligation because you said she committed theft. Are we under any obligation if someone comes in and says, "Hi, I used your insurance card without his permission"? No, that's up to her friend to bring charges. If she wants. It's up to her friend to bring charges. This isn't. We aren't going to mediate this. Any comments from the audience on that? But bottom line is only the account holder can get the information. Okay. Next scenario. The head librarian at a campus library is asked by the chancellor to add information in the library's patron database about a person's criminal behavior. Actually happened. Those dates that I that you see at the bottom of these scenarios are the dates when they these happen. The, the ones without dates, it's so ubiquitous. Is this the criminal behavior that this person stole library materials? Or no. I don't know. It was parking violations. It was something. How is it relevant to the patron record? Not sure that it was. What did you do with that? The, I 
I think the Chancellor was hoping that because we have a database, we could keep track of that. We don't have that field in the workplace. No. <laughs> there, there's, no, there's no criminal field in the workplace. No criminal field in workplace. You're actually getting to the heart of it. Do we have any comments from people on this? Oh. <laughs> okay. The libraries maintain information about a person sufficient to conduct the business of the library, which we then purge according to our record retention policy. Uh, we do not compile dossiers on library users. The library is not a law enforcement agency. We cannot be put in the position of monitoring and reporting the behavior of our users. Okay, this one's going to make you think a little bit. An administrator returns from lunch to find that a staff assistant has taken a phone message. An attorney at University Counsel's office has telephoned and asked that she please call in regards to a subpoena for United Mine Workers records, which are stored at the annex. They are needed for legal proceedings. What should she do? Why did they need a subpoena? These are, these are library materials. Why would they need a subpoena to see them? Uh, the You're the first person to ever get that. <laughs> oh, well, well, I, I, I just see Jim Quiggle all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> you have to go through, go through special collections and talk to the department heads. Okay. The act is not just unaccept or unacceptable, but Closed. 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 So no one except right. librarians could have knowledge. So when we take in collections like that, in special collections, there's a deed of gift, but it's a contract of sorts, mm -hmm. uh, that describes who has access, when they can have access, and how that access is made. So um, with some of the reasons that they restrict access is that um, you know, the restriction can be based on a future date out of deference to uh, the privacy of a third party mentioned in correspondence. Or if we have, like the United Mine Workers, there are personnel records there that aren't to be made public. Um, there was another thing. So oh, an oral history, oral histories that mention uh, somebody. So based on what the subpoena is asking for, this could or could not be taken care of, correct? Correct. Okay. But we will respond to a subpoena. Right. We'll give them a subpoena. There, there are other times, too, when um, regular library materials can be uh, subpoenaed. Um, medical texts, for instance, in uh, legal cases. Uh, it's been my habit to try and persuade them to purchase a copy <laughs> rather than take the library copy because you'll never see it again. Um, they're subpoenaing it because there's nobody who can check it out, right? This is the way lawyers think. It never occurred to them to check out the book from the library. Um, photocopies can suffice as well if they're subpoenaing. You know, they want a table. They want the content. Okay. We're going through these quickly. An individual not associated with the university approaches the circulation desk and presents a legal document embossed with the seal of the county authority that states he is the administrator of a student's estate. The student is deceased. He inquires about the student's library account. Can the library staff discuss the student's account with the non-affiliated individual? <laughs> okay, Jackie's going to bump it up the chain. Nadine wants to see his ID. And then bump it. Any comments from online? Supervisor, 
parent donates to be redirected to the supervisor, if it's not within that polygon so far. Okay. And then I would know if it's not with the field. Mm -hmm. Could be four. An extensive length to go to. Yeah. To see somebody. Maybe it's not all the people at this report. I have no idea. Okay. Mm -hmm. What would have happened to it? Whatever happened to it? <laughs> how was that handled? How was that handled? It, um, I've forgotten now where we've turned to for advice. I probably university council, but the executor of the state has the legal responsibility for settling outstanding accounts and securing any payments due the estate. So, yes, we could discuss with the executor what what is contained in the record because he's now the standing for this person who has died. Um, we recommend that senior staff take this uh, under consideration. Um, somebody with broad oversight because uh, you know we want to handle the matter so that aspects such as refunds, fund waivers, fine waivers and all are considered, not just just, just the narrow checkout thing. You know, and then we'll close out the account and then but yes, the in this case the, this was it was legitimate to speak to somebody else about the account. So how far out did it get from before somebody knew what to do? Um, probably only to the uh, dean's office. But it's a sensitive issue. I mean, even the student mm -hmm. can kind of, you know. Yeah. We want to treat it with a little sensitivity. Mm -hmm. We want somebody with that broader view who can. Okay. An attorney working on a civil litigation matter for the Department of Justice involving a claim for patent infringement against the U.S. government inquires about a 1983 PSU master's thesis that is stored in the annex. See, all of these things end up in the annex. <laughs> he has already spoken with annex staff to determine if it's there. Can we share the thesis with the attorney? Can we tell him when it was indexed in shells, essentially making it public? Can we tell him who checked it out? No, no. Okay. But he could have said, I should check it out as anybody else. Yeah, if he, so if he has borrowing privileges. You'd be surprised at what stuff doesn't have on it. <laughs> um, Okay, so so in the room, we seem to have reached consensus that we're not going to tell him who checked it out. Furthermore, we had we don't have those records; they're long gone. Um, so yes, it was published. It's a master's thesis. It's out there. It's seen the light of day. So that content can be shared. Um, can we tell him when it was indexed and shelved? These are library processes, backroom processes. That doesn't necessarily mean anything. It could be shelved or added to the collection in 2008, you know, or 2006. It just, you know, that's when it was made public from our records. Whether that helps them or not isn't, you know, it's for them to determine. Okay. I bumped it up again. <laughs> but I would be kind of the fact that. Oh, I'm looking at this thing and it says this. At that point, I would. You're a witness. Yeah. And I don't, that's all I would tell mm -hmm. That's all I would keep going. So. Now, if we page back to that policy, is it uh, 08, maybe 08? There's a statement in there about library business practices. Not disclosing library business.
not sure. It took a subpoena, but we gave it readily. Caused no harm to us to, to redeem it. So it's not bad. No. Okay. No. <laughs> what it actually took was somebody who was expert in reading those records and understanding what it means when something is recorded there, like the last the last use field in the workflow records. What does that mean exactly? It, it takes somebody who can actually read and interpret. Sometimes I would say it was last seen or used and mm -hmm. give them the date. That's not wrong, is it? No. Okay. No. Okay. No. Just not the first thing. Right. Okay. Because that's sometimes, well, in different situations, but that's sometimes helpful in trying to track it down if someone's looking. Yeah. Okay. If, it, if it hasn't been used since 2001, it's probably not there. <laughs> Anything else from online before I move on? Other than, um, is the thesis in a public collection? So they can see if the thesis is online. One way to go. 1983. You're going to have to hunt for it. As, as I recall, we actually scanned this. And provided the digital copy. Okay. Late on Sunday evening, a concerned citizen picks up a bag full of library books abandoned at the bus stop and returns them to the library. The bag also contains a white powder. Staff contact university police to report the white powder. Staff then call the department head at home to ask advice about removing the date due slips, which at that time carried the name of the patron in case the police wanted to seize the book. Weren't the books returned to the library? No, nope, they were left at the bus stop in a bag. But, but then somebody else brings them to the library so they return the material. Mm -hmm. So can't you just check in the book and get the police to wait for it? What's the white powder? I have no idea. I got just the book. Any comments on that? Um, just, um, I'm not sure I would touch anything. That's all we have so far. Okay. So you're correct, Robin. Don't tamper with evidence. And if you think it's dangerous, don't touch it. You know, your safety trumps whatever law you think you may be. But if they wanted to take the book. That's a good question. I don't know. I think they'd have to take it somewhere so they have to return it to the mail. Right, right. but I'm saying. But the, wouldn't the person feel responsible for the book? So yeah, check that. So in my opinion. They could take them because they're not taking them from the library. They're not coming in and taking books. It's under the person's name. I think they'd be held responsible. The person was a lead. Is the white powder in both of them can they know they're not leaving any of those privacy, but if it's safe or it's just baby powder, then yeah. 
first you have to realize what we the crime was. And we said that we were still wanting to engage in the police of power. Because we're, we're not supposed to give up pension into any kind of situation. I think once that, that becomes a crime scene, I mean, if, you know, if I contact you know, my administration and, and the police are going to pay, like, you know, I'm not going to interfere. I'm just going to say, you know, we spoke out with the mayor. I'm going to ask them to wait for other administrations to as well. But I'm not going to change myself to a power of will. I would expect that, you know, that would be the right thing to do for the administration to do for all the administrations and all the officials in the area. That means you're going to step up. tamper with what could potentially be evidence. Or danger. Or danger. Or danger. But do you give it to the university police or do you like lock it away and say to your department head or your whoever your supervisor is able to make that call? Um, I need to get a reading on that because as I recall the police did not chase them away. Um, they, they looked in the bag and said nothing. And <laughs> Um, but I'll, I will ask Brandy because she's a great resource for this stuff. Okay, we're at five to the hour. Do you have questions that have arisen that have come up as you thought through this, this scenario? Yeah, we kept saying, 
and it's, it's readily available here. But can you tell me the exact steps? So we had to go through this process. At the end of it, they asked Sam if he would come and testify, but it was a law process, and they wanted her to testify as to the steps that she had given them. And she turned it over to me, and I said, you don't need us to testify about anything because this, you could have Googled this and found it, and I did. I sat down with the other machine and Googled it. But they did not disclose they to you until after the fact. No, so we were quite upset, and I don't know if I handled it appropriately, but there was nobody called us to like to report it or to testify. So I, I guess it was okay. But what do what you do in that case? Well, I have been deposed. I've been uh, subpoenaed and deposed for uh, a, a situation similar to the one where the library processes were asked about and had to produce, I produced uh, an affidavit and then I had to testify. <coughs> I was, my, my, tes my testimony was reported and testimony in a, a, in a deposition is just like in court, you're subject to the same rules. But, you know, you know, I, mean, I could have refused, but they they sent an attorney all the way from Texas <laughs> to ask me questions. Yeah. And how can you remember what you did? Exactly. I mean, it was like they want to use you walking through how you got the thing, and then and then they want you to testify. Right. It's all public. You don't need my testimony. The world is the way. Unless, of course, they came and made us. Then, yeah, fine, I'll go. But in the meantime, you're right. Sounds a little intriguing. Yeah. 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 Anything else? Do we have questions from folks online? Uh, safety trumps everything. If you think it's dangerous, don't touch it. And regardless of whether there were names on those slips in the book or not, leave them alone. That's evidence. You don't tamper with evidence. Right after this. <laughs> They're asking about their behavior, their misbehavior. 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 Right. their misbehavior. Their misbehavior. Right, right. Or any behavior. You know, is there, is there something going on in this space right now by this person's doing that we need to be concerned about? How if, they be if their behavior is of concern that you call the police, right. it's not a library use. Right. No, I'm saying <laughs> that they, they, they come in because they're patients. Right. They can see what they're doing. Okay. That's the hour. Thank you for coming up. I hope this was helpful. I'm sorry? I have 23 scenarios. They, they get strangers, the bigger the number is. Yeah. Thank you. Do you have them somewhere with my answers?